He's given us a great power in his name. We love to call your name. It's something we cannot explain. That happens when we proclaim your great name. Your great name. Call your name. It's something we cannot explain. It happens. Say it again. We love to be love to call your name. Call your name is something we cannot explain. We cannot explain. Oh, yeah. we, yeah. we proclaim your name. Your great name. Your great name. King Jesus. Jesus. King Jesus. No other name. No other King name. Jesus. King Jesus. I'm stronger. I'm stronger. Everything changes. He changes when we call on your name. Come on, say it like you mean it. Sing it, King Jesus. King Jesus. No other name. No other King name. King Jesus. King Jesus. Nobody's stronger. I'm stronger. We can, we can call on you. He changes when we call on your name. There is power in the name of Jesus. Power in your name, oh Lord, there is power in the name of Jesus, power in your name, oh there's power, there's power in the name of Jesus, so much power, power in your name, anybody know there's power, there's power in the name of oh, Jesus, so much power, power in your name.
It's a narrow road that leads to life, but I want to be on it. It's a narrow road that the mercy is wide, but you're good on your promise. And the chaos fell in line But I know Cause I've seen it in my life It's a narrow road That leads to life But I wanna be on it It's a narrow road And the tide is high But you're part of the water
for thee impossible how did I start to believe you weren't sufficient for me why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles you are you are more than able Come on, say it.
He's able. You are more than able. We believe this morning. You are more than able. Who am I? Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? What the Lord can do. I've come along. Way. I've seen how you work. There's so much goodness and grace, much more than deserve. Because I know who I am. I can say where I'm at. We come this far by faith, and I just can't turn back. He's not done with me yet. He's not done with me yet. Come on, you can say it. There's so much more to the story. Oh, yes. You're not done with Bonita Valley, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the service. If you want some info on BVCC, simply complete our online connect card. Here's how it works. 
Scan the QR code you'll find in the seat pocket in front of you with the camera on your smartphone. Open the link that will take you to Connect Card. You'll find a number of connecting options, including first time guests, prayer requests, I want some info on a Bonita Valley ministry. Check the appropriate connection box you're after. Push submit and we'll get back to you ASAP. If you're a first time guest today, please stop by Guest Central at the end of the service and pick up a special gift bag we have just for you. We'd like to take a few moments to tell you about some things coming up for you and your family at Bonita Valley. Active Faith and Fitness 60-Minute Boot Camp class is an invigorating and dynamic workout experience that will leave you feeling strong, revitalized, and empowered. Whether you're a fitness enthusiast or a newcomer looking to jumpstart your wellness journey, this class is designed to help you hit your goals and encourage you spiritually along the way. Boot Camp gathers every Saturday at 8 a.m. on the BBCC lawn. God didn't design ministry for just a few with seminary degrees. At BVCC, we believe that every member of our church is a minister. This is what Base Class 301 is all about. During this class, Pastor Mike will guide you through discovering your shape for ministry and how God can use your spiritual gifts, your heart, your abilities, personality, and experiences to minister to others in need. Discover the significance God has for you in our next 301 seminar happening on Sunday, April 7th from 5 to 7.30 p.m. in the Family Center. Child care and a casual meal will be provided. Sign up online at bonitavalley.com slash base class. With Easter just around the corner and hundreds of new guests will be on our campus, we are excitedly preparing for a life-changing weekend of serving and loving our community in Jesus' name. This effort includes the essential task of building our amazing ministry teams. We have openings in our Good Friday and Easter Sunday services to serve as part of our children's ministry team, our connections team that includes greeting, ushering, and parking, our cafe team, and our tech team. For more information and to sign up, go to BonitaValley.com and choose an Easter weekend serving opportunity under the events tab. We believe God has entrusted us to be managers of our time, talent, and treasures. We believe he wants us to use temporary resources to make a real and eternal difference in our world. And that's what giving at BVCC is all about. When we give to God, we see lives change and transform, both others and ours. There are three ways to give at BBCC. Online at bonitavalley.com slash giving, by texting Bonita Valley to 833-303-9325, or by mailing your offering to BBCC 4744 Bonita Road, Bonita, California, 91902. During our Sunday services, we offer a professionally staffed nursery that will lovingly care for your little one up to two years of age. We also offer an outdoor patio area and a family room with TV monitors for parents who choose to keep children under two years of age with them. Pastor Davida and her team lead incredibly fun ministries for preschool and elementary aged children in the Life Center Gym. Bonita Valley Youth also hosts classes at 9 and 11 a.m. for students in middle and high school in the Fireside Room. During today's service, you can take notes, sign up for events, and even give using your smartphone. Simply use the Follow the Service QR code located in the seat pocket in front of you. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. This weekend, I want to I want to start a, a brand new series with you, a series that I am simply titling "The Final Week." Now, this series is about the most important week in the life of the most important person who has ever lived. The final week in Jesus' life wasn't only the most important week of his life; it's the most important week of our lives. 
or at least it's meant to be, and it can be. Literally, the last week of Jesus' life, his final week changes everything. That's why the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all focus so much on the final week. In fact, John's gospel, and we're going to come to John's gospel in a couple of moments, of all the four gospel writers who share the good news, the story, the account of Jesus' life, John shares the most about the final week. Almost half of John's gospel is focused on the final week of Jesus. He starts it in chapter 12. Chapters 1 through chapter 12 are about the early part, earlier parts in Jesus' life. But from chapter 12 to chapter 21 is all about the last week of Jesus' life. So much happened during that time. And if you and I understand what happened, nothing in our life will be the same. That's why the writers focus on that week. It's why John focuses on that. It's why we're going to focus on the final week of Jesus' life for the next four times we're together today. Next week is Palm Sunday. Then we're going to focus on the final week on Good Friday. And, and you want to be a part of that service. It's going to be a multimedia presentation, our worship team, the songs they have for us that week, the things we're going to see. We'll have communion together. If you want to experience the power of Easter to change your life, you, you got to understand what happened on Friday. So we're going to have a great time together, and, and, and I encourage you to be a part of that time. And then on Easter Sunday, we'll have three services at, at 9, at 11, at 1 p.m. And in all three services, we're going to focus on what, the end of what happened in that final week, which means nothing is over for us. We're going to talk about that, and it's coming up. Uh, this, next, this next couple of weeks, you just do not want to miss. Because to get them is to get life. So I hope you'll be a part of these next several weeks. But I want us to focus as we get started in this new series. I want us to focus on how John begins to describe the final week of Jesus' life. John chapter 12, verse 1. He writes, six days before the Passover... That's the day Jesus was crucified. Six days before his crucifixion, Jesus came to Bethany. Let me just push pause. Now, many of us hear these, these places in the Bible like, where are they? And, and some of us have, have, have had the privilege of going to Israel and, and seeing some of these places ourselves. But I want to show you just for a moment on a map so you have some kind of orientation about what's happening. Let me show you a picture. And this will give you a little idea. You see Jerusalem. You see the temple. Now, if you look into my... Well, to your right, you see Bethany. You see the Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives in Bethany. Now, Bethany is about two miles from the city of Jerusalem. About two miles. Between Bethany and Jerusalem, you can't see Jerusalem from Bethany. Now, sometimes when I'm driving down Otai Lakes Road and it comes down the hill, I can look and see San Diego. Can you see San You can see the buildings. You can see the ocean. You could not see Jerusalem from Bethany. There was a mountain in the way, like Mount Miguel was in the way. So you couldn't see straight through the mountain. You could see the Mount of Olives, but you couldn't see Jerusalem. Now, now why is that important? Because you, you only went two miles, but you were a world away from Jerusalem. Okay, are you with me? You were a world away from Jerusalem. Bethany was kind of this sleepy little place, a smaller town. It was away from, it was like down in this valley, it was away from the hustle, the bustle, the noise, the crowd, all the Jerusalem stuff. In fact, I love what one writer, he described Bethany in this way. Bethany was not a place where you go to make your name. Bethany was a place where you went to belong. It was a place of community. It was a place of families. It was a place of relationships. You, you didn't go to Bethany unless, Bethany unless you knew somebody in Bethany. You went to Bethany because it was a place of connection. Now, given that background, John says, Jesus goes to Bethany. Let's pick it up. And, and so Jesus, it says that, that six days he came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. 
And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. John says on the last week of Jesus' earthly life, he goes to a dinner. Not just a dinner. He knows what's coming. He knows the cross is six days away. And he goes to a, a dinner with some of his closest friends. He goes to a time, was to, there's a price on his head. They're already trying to kill Jesus. They're trying to, they're, they're, they're already have, have, have said, if you turn him in, we'll pay you. If you see him, turn him in. And he goes to Bethany to a place where his closest friends were. Now, I'm not talking about social media friends. I'm talking about face-to-face -face friends. How many of you have close friends? I don't mean, I don't mean you know, on Instagram or Facebook. Facebook. Well, I, I don't mean any of those things. Come on, how many of you know on Facebook, people make their lives look so incredible? <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, right. No, he, he, he went to some people that, I'm talking about people that, that are you're close to face to face and heart to heart. You cannot be heart to heart on social media. You can't. Because you got to see them. You got to sense them. You, you, pick on, you pick up on somebody when they pause, when they breathe, how they look when they say it. So Jesus goes to some friends, his closest friends. He makes a choice on his final week to be with some of his closest friends. And I believe that John shows us in this passage, there's so, so much here, more than we're going to cover in this one time together. But I believe John was showing us something about what it means to be one of Jesus' closest friends and how we are to be one. He shows us the people that were closest to Jesus and why they were closest to Jesus. Now, you may or may not know this, but Jesus has chosen you to be his friend. He really has. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. He's our God. But he says to his disciples, I have chosen you to be friends. Jesus chooses you to be his friend. But listen, it's our choice that determines how close a friend with Jesus we are. He chooses you to be his friend. You choose how close to Jesus you are as his friend. And John shows us some of the closeness choices. In fact, one writer puts it like this. We are as close to Jesus as we choose to be. So how do I choose to be close to Jesus? Let, let me walk you through what John shows us in this amazing dinner. Here's the first. Jesus' closest friends have worshiping him hearts. Now, I know that phrase, it seems a little awkward, but, but they don't just have worshiping hearts because everybody has a worshiping heart, everybody. Believers, non-believers, you've never met anybody without a worshiping heart. But not everybody worships Jesus with their heart. All right, let me help you. One of the most simple definitions of worship that I've run across is simply this one. Worship is our response to what we value most. That's worship. Worship is to give worth, it's to see value, it's to, it's to want value, it's to go after value. So everybody values something, someone, sometime, everybody worships. Everybody has something that, that fills their heart, that fills their mind. But that's not always Jesus. Again, one of my favorite worship statements comes from Louis Giglio who writes, so how do you know what you value most, what you worship? It's easy. You simply follow the trail of your time, your affection, your energy, your money, your loyalty. At the end of that trail, you will find a throne. And whatever or whomever is on that throne, it's what's of highest value to you. On that throne is what or whom you worship. Sure, not too many of us walk around saying, I worship my stuff, I worship my Xbox. I worship my job. I worship this pleasure. I worship him. I worship her. I worship my body. I worship me. But the trail never lies. We may say we value this thing or that thing more than any other, but the volume of our actions speak louder than our words. 
In the end, our worship is more about what we do than what we say. Everybody worships, but not everybody worships Jesus. His closest friends value him most, worship him most. The closest friends to Jesus not only value him, they worship him with all they are with their entire life. Now, in fact, Jesus tells the Samaritan woman in John 4, and you remember the story, and, and he tells her that, that God seeks those who will, what? Worship him in spirit, not a Holy Spirit, a small s, with our whole heart, mind, soul, and body, who worship him with all they are in spirit and in truthfulness, in truth. Now, why does God seek worshipers? Let me help you with this. How many know that God doesn't need you telling him he's great to know he's great? Are you with me? Let me put it another way. God doesn't need your worship, but we need to worship. God doesn't need my worship. So why does he seek worshipers? Because he knows that if we, he knows this, that you and I become like whomever or whatever we worship. So he says, worship me, because you were created by me to be just like me, to connect with me. And you will never experience life as it was meant to be unless, unless you value and worship me first. See, okay, clue phone for just a moment. How many of you know life is not all about you? Amen. And apparently some of you don't know that. That's the truth. And life is not all about me. And when you and I try to make life all about ourselves, we try to make ourselves the center of it all. And let me just tell you what, our default mode, every one of us, is selfishness. Now, you look so godly. Let me just try this. Just make sure you're kind of with me here. I mean, have you ever seen a group picture that you were in? And the first face you looked for was yours. How do I look? Come on. We used to call them yearbooks. I don't know if some people call them annuals. You got, your, you got your high school, middle school, whatever it is. I mean, the first person you looked up is you. Now, come on, in a group picture, and you look up and you see, and if you look good, it's a good picture. Right? Like all these phone companies, they've all figured it out how to fix faces and stuff because everybody else looks horrible. But if you look good, this is a good picture. That's where our eyes go, to self. But if you want to you make a mess of your life, just live it all about you. Because we're not the center of it all. And so God says, worship me because, because if you get me in the right place, everything else will be in the right place. And if you don't get me in the right place, nothing's in the right place. So Jesus challenges us to love him, to worship him back. Worshiping Jesus is life-orienting, it's life-transforming, it's our true north. When you worship him, your life is set in the right direction. Worshiping Jesus is also life-transforming. All worship is transformational. You become like whatever you worship. But watch this, Paul writes in Romans 12, verse 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and a holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to say it. Worship him. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of the world, but let God transform you, metamorphosize you into the new person by changing the way you think. And then you'll learn to know God's will for you which is good and pleasing and perfect or completing, it'll transform you when, when you worship him. See, the question isn't, am I a worshiper? You are. Everyone, you've never met anyone who's not a worshiper. The only question is, who or what are you worshiping? Jesus' closest friends. I, I, I got to keep on. I can't turn this one message into a series. But let me tell you something. The reason you can value God is because he first values you. Jesus values, he says, you're worth more than the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Why? Because God values you. That's his choice. Worship is choosing to value him back. 
to say, God, you're the greatest value in my life, and my, my life all center around valuing, worshiping you. So that's the first part that makes a close friend of Jesus. But here's the second. From this dinner, we learn that Jesus' closest friends have a primary worship language. Those who are the closest friends of Jesus are worshipers, but they have a primary worship language. Now, some of you are familiar with, you've read Gary Chapman's book, The Five Love Languages. Gary Chapman was just here earlier this month uh, when Arlene Pellican uh, hosted and, and, and put on the, 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 the Parents Rising Conference, uh, amazing conference. In fact, it's on her website. Uh, and, and if you weren't here, Gary Chapman was here. He, he just he shared the five love languages, how it applies to our children. It was outstanding. He talked about anger. It was great. And if you missed it, you missed it. But... It's on her website, and, and, and she has a website, and she has all kinds of great stuff. And I, was, I looked it up even last night. It's happyhomeuniversity.com. Happy Home University. There's a university for having a happy home. And, and, and you can still, uh, you're able to watch, and, and there's a way that you can watch what was shared here just earlier this month. But Gary Chapman shares these five love languages, and one of the things he talks about is we all have kind of this primary love language. It doesn't mean you only have one. We, we have really all of these, but one is kind of our predominant language that we understand love, that we speak love. And, and, and I think that's very helpful, very insightful, and very true. But let me tell you something else. You have a primary worship language. Not just how you love others, how you love God. You have a primary worship language. And in this story, we see three of the primary worship languages. <sighs> see if you can identify with any of these. Let me show you out of the story. Martha's primary worship language was serving Jesus. John 2, verse 2, we just read it a moment ago. A dinner was given in Jesus' honor. This is to express high value and worth to Jesus. Martha, say it served. Martha loved Jesus. And the way she loved Jesus back was serving Jesus. It's how she expressed high value to the one she loved the most. Now, Martha, if you've ever studied her life in the times we see her in scripture, Martha was a doer. How do you know doers? They're just doing something all the time, just doing people. They just do things all the time. And that's who Martha was. Now, she had learned at a previous dinner and some of you know the story, it's shared in Luke's gospel, that on a, a, another occasion, Jesus stops by Bethany because he loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Now, Martha's name often came first. Just know this, in the Bible, the order of names often tells us kind of who was the leader of that group. You know how many times you read about the disciples, it starts with Peter? Because he was the leader. So when you read, when you read Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, because Martha was in charge. She was the in charge person. It was called Martha's house. Now, I don't know who owned the title deed, but everybody knew she was the owner. She was the leader. They come to the house, the disciples. We don't know if they gave advance notice. There was no texting. We're on our way. And on these disciples, Jesus shows up. She serves them. You know the story. And it, it, it's, it's tough serving all these people and all these men and all this stuff. So, and Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, and Martha's getting ticked with her sister for not helping her. I think that was on one level. The second level was women were not at these events. They were not at the table. And so she's like, that's not where you belong. And so she's just, how many of you ever had someone serve and they're just ticked off? And that's what Martha's doing. She's just ticked off. She even gets a little upset with Jesus. Now, how many know that, that your serving is kind of losing it when you start yelling at Jesus? Okay, so she starts saying, Jesus, tell my sister to help me. But Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, he helps Martha with her serving. He doesn't tell her don't serve. She was gifted to serve. He just tells her something about serving. He says, in this moment, Mary has chosen the better thing. What's the better thing? Listen, if you don't choose to be with me, you're serving me, will miss its best. How many know you can serve with a bad attitude? How have you been served with a bad attitude? Here it is. Thanks. Now, I get it either way. 
But one way comes out of a really good heart, and the other way is not so much. And Jesus is saying, Martha, please don't substitute serving me for loving me. Serving me can be an expression of your loving me, but your loving me will make your serving me that much deeper and better and impacting. He doesn't rebuke her for serving. He created her. That's how she was wired. But he challenged her not to serve without being with him. Now, to Martha's incredible credit, now we read of her again, and this time she's serving again. She serves all these people. She serves, now there's a chance, and this story is in three Gospels, there's a really good chance they're in Bethany, but they're not at Lazarus and Martha and Mary's home. Some translations kind of say they are, others say they were at the home of Simon. I actually believe they were at Simon's home. Simon was a, a leper that Jesus had healed. Obviously, he's a healer, he wouldn't be at his house, but he's in the same town. I think they're at Simon's house, and Martha is serving at Simon's house, because like she's the caterer. She's, if you want someone to get dinner done, it is Martha. So Martha is there serving this large group. But watch this, she's still serving. Bless her heart, she's still serving, but this time she doesn't get ticked with anybody, because she's growing. As a person, as a believer, as a server, as a worshiper. Worshiping was Martha's language. And serving was how she expressed that worship. There's a whole group of you who yesterday worshiped God at Bonita Valley. And you go, come on, I didn't hear there was a worship service. There was. There was a worship service here yesterday. It was called a work day. And it was amazing how many of you showed up. Well, let me just show you how, how many of you were here yesterday worshiping. Just watch the screens. Yeah, just tell him. That was a worship service. Paul says, whatever you do for Jesus, glorify him. Wednesday night, I was pulling out of here to go real quick to pick up some food to come back. And as I'm pulling out, I see students all over the campus picking up trash. They got, they got buckets. They got bags. I'm like... What is this? First, I got to make sure I'm not stealing. They weren't stealing, they were picking stuff up. <laughs> I want to thank Pastor Dan. Our students, your kids won't pick up their room. They were picking up trash. <laughs> Before their service, they were having a worship service. Do you know when you serve God, you worship Him? 
And, and uh, let, let me listen very carefully. Our Easter services are coming up. And, and, and you heard it earlier in the video now. So let me just show you on, on the screen, on the app, on the phone. It, it, has a, it has a volunteer way that you can click on and choose an area of service on the website. It does the same thing. On Easter weekend, Good Friday, three Easter services. We need hundreds of you to serve Jesus and serve others. Now, I know it can be one of those days, I got a brunch, it's Easter, I got family, and I appreciate all of that, but how many know that Easter can change lives forever? And I can't encourage you enough, we need hundreds to be in a service and to serve in a service. We will have, I think last year, they had almost 1,000 kids, I don't know, they had kids everywhere. And, and so we need people who will attend a service and serve in a service, and you're like, well, I don't know, what to, listen, you just show up. And they will help you. They will tell you, you may not have a spiritual call to be a parking director. But for one week, that might not be your primary love language, but every language we can use. And I can't encourage you enough to be part of an Easter miracle. And how do you do that? You say, God, I'm going to worship you like Martha with my serving. For some of you, that's just how you're wired you have to be doing something. Just make sure what you, you do it in Jesus' name and you do it for him. It will change your life and share, change other lives. So that's one of the first primary worship languages is Martha's. Let me give you a second from Lazarus. Lazarus' primary worship language was showing Jesus. John 12, verse 2. We read it. Lazarus was among those, What? reclining at the table with him. Now, again, what that means is he wasn't just like lounging around. You reclined at the tables. Now, if you've seen the portrait of, of like the Last Supper, it's like that's not really what it looked like. They weren't all on the same side of the table so they could all get in the picture. That's not how it actually <laughs> works. They actually reclined at a table. You, you leaned on your arm and, and you ate. And so, so he's reclining. He's at, he's at this table in a conversation. And the, the dinners could last for hours. Great conversation. And that's where Lazarus is. Lazarus is, showing, Lazarus is a walking, talking, reclining miracle. Only days earlier he had been in a tomb. For four days. Previous chapter, not, not much before this dinner. Week, week and a half. He was dead. He was in a tomb. Jesus showed up. The ultimate tomb raider, death defeater. I know this isn't Easter, so you're not excited yet, but you should be excited with that. Jesus didn't just say, I resurrect. He said, I am the resurrection. <laughs> he didn't just say, I resurrect dead people. He said, wherever I am, there is life. Death flees where Jesus is because he is the resurrection. He brings things back to life. And so Lazarus is brought back to life. And, and, and now he's alive. And, and people were even coming from Jerusalem to see him. Crowds came to see the guy that was dead and he's now alive. Let's go see that. It's only two miles away. Let's go see the guy who was dead for four days. He's alive now. Wherever Lazarus went, whatever Lazarus did, he showed Jesus. He said, I'm a walking, talking example of what Jesus can do. Showing Jesus with our miraculous new life. And if you're a believer, you have one. If you're a believer in Jesus, you have a miraculous new life. It's one of the most powerful worship languages and witnesses there is. In fact, there's a song written several years ago, sung by Jamie Grace. It's a really, really fun little song. I'm not going to sing it to you, but I'm going to give you the lyrics. Okay? I, I just love this little song because it's exactly what Lazarus did. The song says this. Your smile's always shining out and they know what it's all about. It's not hard for them to figure out the way you show Jesus. You know love is what they heard, even though you didn't say a word. Ain't it funny that's the way it works when you know Jesus? It's like flipping on a light switch when you're walking into this room. So undeniable, anytime, anywhere, anyplace. It's written all over your face, the way you love Jesus. 
It always speaks to me a little joy with a touch of peace. It's so inspiring the way you show Jesus. How many know that how you live shows who you live for? It really does. So Lazarus didn't say a lot, partly because he had two sisters and there wasn't much room for him to, well, it's the way. <laughs> Don't write me letters. <laughs> if you grew up in a house with two sisters, you're not the talker, I'll just guarantee you. Well, I'm just saying. But he did speak by just showing up. There's Lazarus. I mean, no, when you walk where you work, where you live, your life shows. One of the ways I worship Jesus, Jesus said, let your light so shine, show me, that they'll see, your, they'll see your good works and glorify you. No, they'll see your good works and glorify me, your Father, your Father in heaven. So one of my worship languages is, I can't stop here, drive like Jesus would drive. Can, I'm working on that one. Tip like Jesus would tip. Ooh, it gets quiet. Showed you, I, I keep moving. Here's a third. Mary's primary worship language was lovingly sacrificing for Jesus. Back to what we read, John 12, verse 3. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet, wiped his feet with her hair. That didn't shock us, but that culture, that was shocking. And the house was filled, say it out loud, with the fragrance of the perfume. That's a powerful line. Now, nard, it sounds kind of gross. No, nard, nard sometimes was called spike nard. It was a very, very expensive imported perfume from India. That's a long way from Israel. It was often transported and given in an alabaster jar. Let me give you a picture. Here's an alabaster jar. Just so you can kind of picture what a precious jar with an incredibly expensive perfume. In fact, we're told in the story how much this alabaster jar of about a pint, 16 ounces or so of perfume was worth. It was worth 300 denarii. What is that? That was a full year's wages. One denarii is about what one person made in one day's work. So it's like 300 days of work. So take your yearly salary, your entire yearly income. That's what that was worth. Mary, the women were not at the table. Again, culturally, the, the men were at the table and the women. But, but Mary slips into this dinner. And she takes this, this incredibly valuable alabaster jar and she breaks it open. John says she poured it on Jesus' feet. The other writers say she poured it on his head and his feet. She poured it on someone's his head and the rest, she just emptied it on his feet. Then she dries his feet with her, again, for us, we're like, what is that? In that culture, once a woman got married, her hair was put up and she was never in public with her hair down. It was an insult, it was, it was horrible, it was just a cultural thing. So a woman did not take her hair down in front of others. She takes down her hair because she didn't care what anybody thinks. She humbles herself with her tears and her hair. She wipes his feet. Let me tell you something about that room. They were shocked. They were shocked and they became indignant. They became angry. Everybody in that room was shocked and ticked off by what Mary did except Jesus. Now let me, help you, let me explain, help explain. Why were they shocked? Why were they so upset with her? Well, well let me show you another bottle. Okay, let me, show you, let me show you some bottles. Dom Perignon, vintage 1959, Rose Rosé. Okay, now, now these bottles, let me, let me, one of these bottles was auctioned in 2024. Just take a guess how much that bottle sold for. Anybody? Quick guess. Just think. Yeah. It sold for $84,700. First of all, no, it wasn't one of my bottles. I don't have, I have no clue. But here's what I want you to imagine. $84,700 bottle of 
champagne. And your kid is part of the winning t-ball team. The winning t-ball championship. And you take a bottle of Tom Perignon 1959 Rosé and you pop the cork and you shake it up and you spray it all over the field. Because my kid won the t-ball championship. So did all of them because everybody wins now. So anyway, so... Everyone's, we are the champions, everybody's the champion. Yeah, that's, that's us. And if somebody says, what are you spraying? I'm spraying 1959 vintage. Are you stupid? <laughs> what a waste. Give it to me. That's really what Judah said. Let me sell it. Let me have it. Let me drink it. Let me give it. Let me, let me use it to help other people. You got to be crazy. What kind of nut job would do that? Are you with me? Only two of you. I mean, so anyway, I tried. But that's, that's kind of the shock value of what she did. It blew them away. It didn't blow Jesus away. In fact, I want to show you what he thought about what she did and what he said about what she did. Mark chapter 14, verse 8. Jesus says, she did what she could when she could. She pre-anointed my body for burial. Let's leave this verse up for just a moment because I want to I show you something. This verse is an entire message series in itself. If you want to be an incredibly close friend of Jesus, here it is. Do what you can when you can for Jesus. Do what you can. No, no, no. She had this bottle. Now, how did she have it? Was it given to her? Did she buy it? Was it her dowry for, for the few? I have no idea. It was the way some people saved their money. It was in socks and bonds. It was in perfumes, very expensive. I don't, I don't know how she got it, but it's what she had. She didn't give what she didn't have. She gave what she had. Do what you can with what you have. But don't miss this. She did what she could when she could. How many know that you will not always have the right chance to do the right thing? That there's something about not only doing the right thing, but doing the right thing at the right moment. If you want to love Jesus, if you want to be close to Jesus, do what you can when you can. There's so much in this verse, but let me just give you a couple of reasons why I believe that she did what she did. No doubt because she was un, unbelievably thankful to Jesus for bringing her brother back from the dead. There's no doubt that she gave him thanks. Whether she thanked him on that day, I'm sure she did, but now it's a week plus later and she's just, she can't stop thanking Jesus for giving Lazarus back to them. No words could express her thanks. That's part of why she did what she did, because words weren't enough. But there's more. Mary was an incredible worshiper of Jesus because she was an incredible listener to Jesus. Mary was an incredible worshiper to Jesus because she was an incredible listener of Jesus, in fact, I believe that Mary was perhaps the best listener Jesus had. Come on. How many of you have somebody in your life that really listens? I mean really listens. They get it. Not just the words, the feelings, the meaning. They get you because they listen to you not only with their ears, but with their eyes, with their hearts. Mary heard things Jesus said, and she sensed a moment that none of his disciples got. Nobody got in that room except Mary. Jesus had been saying things to prepare his disciples for what was coming, but they weren't listening. He had been saying it and saying it. In fact, I want to show you. I'm going to move through these quickly because some of you go, man, that was a lot of verses. And I'm going to move through these quickly. But I want to show you how much Jesus said about this last week and what was coming and how he got more and more descriptive, detailed. Let me walk quickly. Mark 8, verse 31. Then Jesus began to tell them, his disciples, that the Son of Man, that's Jesus, must suffer 
many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed, but three days later, he would rise from the dead. Mark 9, next chapter, verse 31. Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed. New detail. Into the hands of his enemies, he will be killed, but three days later, he will rise from the dead. Mark 10, verse 33. Listen, Jesus says. We're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed. To the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, they will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. New fact. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him with a whip, and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. You think Jesus knew? He knew exactly what was going to happen. And he tells them exactly what's going to happen. Watch this. Verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. <laughs> Here's my question. You think they were listening? The son of man, the Romans are going to crucify him, whip him, beat him, spit on him. Okay, but, but can, can you do us a favor? Are, are you with me? Come on, have you ever really told somebody your heart and then they just went a whole different direction? Because while you were talking, they weren't listening. Mary was. I think Mary's the only one who not only heard what he said, she believed it. See, I don't, they couldn't quite figure out, like, what's he talking about? But they didn't even ask him. In fact, when he talked about what was going to happen to him, at one point Peter says, Jesus, never, that's not going to happen to you. And Jesus said, get behind me because that's Satan trying to stop me because this is my mission. They didn't get it and they didn't want it. That wasn't the kind of Messiah they were looking for. But Mary was. And Mary realized that Jesus was going to die soon. She heard him say it. She sensed it because she was attuned to him in ways that nobody else in that room was. How do you attune your heart to Jesus? I'm going to show you real fast. Because there are three biblical snapshots of Mary with Jesus that show us how and why she heard and sensed what nobody else did. And I give this to you quickly. In Luke 10, you'll find Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. That means she's a student. She's a learner. That's the position you took to learn. You would sit at the teacher's feet. She was learning. In John 11, Mary is surrendering at Jesus' feet. Lazarus has died. Jesus doesn't even show up. He misses the funeral. When he shows up four days later, Martha runs out and talks to him. And then Mary runs out and says the same thing. But she doesn't just run out and stand she falls at his feet, and she surrenders at his feet. If you had been here, she surrenders her pain, her hurt, her brother, her heart. The shortest verse in the Bible comes after she surrenders at Jesus' feet, and it says, and Jesus wept. See, her question was, do you care? And he weeps. He was telling her, this is, I'm going to raise you from the dead, but I do care. And then this third picture of Mary is here, Mary sacrificing at Jesus' feet. If you want to know why Mary heard what nobody else heard, it's for three, three reasons. It's because she chose to sit, she chose to surrender, and she chose to sacrifice. You want to know Jesus? You want to be close to Jesus? My prayer for me, my prayer for you, is that we would be people who sit at his feet, who surrender at his feet, and who sacrifice at his feet. Because you will tune in to what's going on in ways that nobody else will, because that's, that's the people who really get what Jesus says and what Jesus wants to do. And I add one more quick detail that John gives, and, and I think it has double meaning. I really do. And John says, and the fragrance of the perfume filled the house. They're like, yeah, duh. Now, this is pure perfume. Now, I had an experience with this. It's real fast. I was in Israel. When I was just in high school, I had a chance to go to on Israel. I knew I was going into the ministry, kind of a long story, how I got to go, church group, whole thing. So I, I go to Israel. 
And I'm just like this kid. But, and so I'm traveling to Israel. It is fun. And they took us to this perfume, I don't know, the factory. I don't know what it, what it was. But you could actually buy just the pure perfume, the oil. Now, it wasn't like in a bottle. In fact, you, you bought the pure perfume, and then you're supposed to mix it with other stuff because it was like it could make multiple bottles, okay? So it's super strong. Are you with me? So, so I buy this, and I'm a kid, but I didn't wrap it properly. Like, I really wasn't that into how, uh, packing. So, so, so I put it in my suitcase, and by the time I got home, it broke. So now this pure perfume, which was incredibly strong, well, I'll put it like this. My suitcase smelled like that perfume until I threw it away. Because, <laughs> like, that, that, that fragrance was in there forever. Okay, no. John says that Mary's act of worship, the perfume of her worship, filled the house. Everybody got it. But let me take it one more step. I believe that the perfume on Jesus' clothes were with him all the way to the cross. All the way there. You can smell the love. Do you know that your love ministers to God as God ministers to us? That God had anointed Jesus for this purpose and Mary reminds him with the perfume that you are anointed by God. The perfume I broke over you is just a picture of your brokenness for us. And all the way there, there's no doubt. You can smell that perfume. Your worship is more powerful than you know. And John says it lingered. It, it impacted everyone. So there are worship languages of, of serving, of showing, and of sacrificing. And then just one more, one more insight. One more lesson and observation. Jesus' closest friends don't allow worshiping criticism to stop them. John 12, verse 4 again. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, that perfume was worth a, a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. And John adds this, not that he gave a rip, not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. Since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Verse 7, Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You'll always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Judas was the first to criticize and rebuke Mary for wasting such expensive perfume, but she wasn't, he wasn't the only or the last. If you read the other Gospels, you discover this, that Judas' criticism is contagious, and all the disciples start saying the same thing. All the guys joined. Yeah, man, what are you doing, man? What are you thinking? The word says they became indignant. It's a very strong word. They were piling on Mary. They were getting on her. What are you... Can you sense for a moment with me? They are getting on... Here's what you've got to understand, and this story helps us. Expect criticism when you worship Jesus with all you are and all you have. Don't be blown away. Don't stop giving thanks. Don't stop giving worship because somebody, it's not just spiritual outsiders. That's what Judas was. That's all Judas could do. But it was the spiritual insiders. It was the disciples that also rebuked her. Now listen to me. Some of you are so full of what Jesus has done for you that you want to love him back with anything and everything and all the things that you have. And sometimes others around you say, pull it back a little bit. Like, don't go so all out. Like, it's fine that you have this God thing, but, but don't go crazy about it. Now, there's people driving by this church today, and they see your car in the parking lot and go, what a waste. It's a great Sunday. They're a church. What a waste. No, we're not wasting a day. Them, we, it's easy to ignore. But what about the person? What about your family member? What about your, your friends? What about people that just think you're, you're a bit too intense about Jesus? 
I'll tell you why people often put down our worship, because it convicts them about their worship. <laughs> if you work really hard at your job, somebody will tell you, pull it back, because I don't want to work that hard. When somebody really worships, well, come on, dial that back. Because I don't feel that way. Do not let the criticism of others, insiders or outsiders, stop you from giving thanks. Because listen to me. Jesus not only defended Mary, he defends you. He stepped in and said, leave her alone. In the Old Testament, Satan was accusing the high priest. And Jesus said, I rebuke you. The Bible says we have an accuser of the brethren. Satan accuses you and me. And Jesus says, just stop it. You have a defender of your life. Let me tell you something. you got to know this about Jesus. He loves you and he is proud of you. Are you perfect? No, nobody is, but he's perfecting you. And he defends you. I tell you, I, I, it's in the story. He says what Mary, what this woman has done will be remembered and talked about. He prophesies that her story would be told, and we're fulfilling that prophecy today. I'm so proud of you, Mary, that as often as the gospel is told, they'll talk about you because I am proud of you. They may talk about you behind your back. I talk about you to your face. Because I tell you, you mean the world to me. Some of you have got to fix your eyes on him and not on others. Because when you worship, it's all about him. It is. In the final week of Jesus' life, he shows us his value and his priority by going to the house of some of his closest friends. Before he started the most difficult week of his life, he started with the closest people to him. And in this story, we not only just read a historical story about a, a friendship dinner, we discover what it takes and what it means to be a friend of Jesus. Because everything in this final week is meant for us to change us, challenge us. So how do I become a friend of God? He chooses me. He starts it. He's the friend initiator, but I've got to choose him back. You are as close to Jesus as you choose to be. And you see others who are closer than you, it's not because God loves them more. It's because they chose him in ways that you and I haven't chosen him. So how do I choose to get closer? How do I choose to be closer? How do I choose to be more and more like him? How do I choose to be transformed by him? Because whatever I worship, whomever I worship is who I become. And we see three ways, one more time, that you and I become closest friends of Jesus by having a worshiping him heart. We all worship, do I worship him in spirit and in truth with everything that I am? We all have worshiping language. We really do. You have a love language. You have a worship language. I don't know what it is for you. You don't just have one. We, we have multiple, but you have a primary language. For some of you, it is serving. It's just how you're wired. You saw the video. Some of you are amazing. I, I'm blown away, even for the, the thing yesterday. And they, they, they showed up at 8 o'clock, and, and, and Beth Cadrillo, who runs our cafe, and she can use some help there. She was here at 6 o'clock in the morning putting coffee on. I mean, well, things go better with coffee. So 6 a.m. she's here for an 8 a.m. and she's putting coffee. Why? Because people love God with serving. So if your, your language is serving, surf. Others, it's showing. God has done such an amazing work in your life. Let it show. Don't hide it. You can't walk into a room without a light switch. Go Jesus has changed my life. Your smile, your actions, your attitudes, they show... Lazarus just showed Jesus by reclining, and they came from far and wide. I got to see the guy who was dead, and he's alive. You were dead, and you're alive. Let it show. Show Jesus. Lovingly sacrifice for him. Mary did what she could when she could. 
That's what Jesus challenges us to do. And then when you do that, you're going to be criticized. Jesus constantly said, get ready. If they did it to me, they'll do it to you. The idea of no pressure, now there's no life without, but don't let criticism by the insiders or outsiders stop you. Don't let criticism silence your thanks or silence your praise or silence your worship. I don't mean to offend you, but I'm not worshiping for you. I'm worshiping for him. And when you and I do these things that they did at this dinner, you'll be one of Jesus' closest friends. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me? Jesus, I thank you for this story. I pray that you would speak to us today on one of the deepest levels that Holy Spirit, you go beyond just words and pictures. And I pray that you would speak deep into our spirit, our mind, our body. There is no friend like Jesus. And I pray that we will be the closest friends to Jesus that we can be because we choose to be. With heads bowed, eyes closed just for a moment. You can make a choice today to say yes to the Jesus who loves you, values you more than you know. Online, wherever you are, whatever time it may be in this room. If you've never said yes to Jesus, offer to be your savior, your leader, your friend. I just encourage you to pray a simple surrendering prayer with me. It's not a formula prayer. It's not a form prayer. It's not even what you feel. It's just a decision of your heart that simply says this, Jesus, I accept you as the savior of my life. Forgive me of my sins, of making life about me. Thank you for paying for my sins. And I choose to love you back with my whole life in Jesus' name. And I pray, Father God, for a house of worship and a house of worshipers in Jesus' name.